G6 P deficiency is supposed to be the most common enzyme deficiency in the world. In fact, I'm not talking about the most common enzyme deficiency causing hemolysis. Remember, G6 P deficiency is supposed to be the most common enzyme deficiency in the world. In fact, I'm not talking about the most common enzyme deficiency causing hemolysis. The most common enzyme deficiency in the world itself overall is G6 P deficiency. It's such a common entity. Majority of the patients will be asymptomatic though because they don't have any um, you know, like severe decline in the enzyme. But apart from that, this is the most common enzyme deficiency in the world. And if you ask me why G6PD is important, you can relate to, I mean, all these three enzyme deficiencies are related to the mdn mayer pathway, that is the glycolysis. But in G6TD, you know very well, this glucose 6-phosphate 10% enters the uh, hexose monophosphate shunt, that is HMP shunt. If you have a G6PD deficiency, and again, the HMP shunt is very important for the production of NADPH. If you have G6PD deficiency, you are going to have reduced levels of NADPH. So if you ask me why NADPH is very important, you know very well, this NADPH will become NADP. This NADP, NADPH conversion to NADP is very important to restore the glutathione stores, reduce glutathione stores. Initially, glutathione will be in oxidized form or non-reduced form to make the glutathione into reduced form or to convert the glutathione to reduced form and to maintain the stores of reduced glutathione. This NADPH conversion to NADP is extremely important. Why this reduced glutathione is very important? We know very well. We have already discussed all this in the basic section, but still I'll recap right now. Because this reduced glutathione becomes oxidized, but it actually reduces the because it pushes the hydrogen to the uh, you know like certain oxidizing compounds and reduces them. For example, best example example I'm telling a lot of compounds like this are the best example is hydrogen peroxide, which converts into harmless water molecules. Which means if this hydrogen peroxide is not some oxidant molecules are not converted to neutral substance like water, if it's not reduced to neutral substance like water, this is going to create oxidative damage to the cells. Oxidative damage and oxidation related damage to the cells. Typically, you know, like they are going to produce superoxide radical, they are going to produce hydroxyl radical. So many problems are there with this hydrogen peroxide and other, I mean, similar oxidant molecules like this. So that is the reason why uh, it is really, really important to understand the importance of NADPH. So what happens if you have a reduced NADPH? If you have a reduced NADPH, your glutathione conversion to reduced glutathione will be very poor, which means your stores of glutathione will be lost. I mean, reduced glutathione will be lost, which means your oxidative molecules cannot be reduced to harmless substances. So which means the oxidative substances amount in the cell will increase. Once it increases in the cell, your oxidative damage will increase and production of all these free radicals also will increase in amount inside the cell. So this oxidative damage, if it increases, they are going to damage proteins especially. Typically what they damage is the hemoglobin. This hemoglobin will come and settle on the RBC membrane. This is the you know, like damaged hemoglobin molecule or otherwise you can call it as oxidized hemoglobin or you can call it as a denatured hemoglobin or oxidized hemoglobin. That is because of excess oxygen damage due to g 6 p deficiency. They come and settle in the RBC membrane. They precipitate in the RBC membrane and this precipitation of this hemoglobin molecules over the RBC membrane is what we refer to as something called Heinz bodies. And the areas that contain this damaged hemoglobin that is settled within the membrane. For example, if you have RBC with a Heinz body over here, if it's settled here and this area will be bitten off by the macrophage. The macrophage is going to bite this area off and it's going to result in something called a bite cell or they can form something called a blister cell, a bite cell or a blister cell which you have seen already, blight cell or a blister cell, that's what is going to happen. So this is what uh, typically results in a g 6 p deficiency. All these are pathophysiology of why the problem because all the problem g 6 p is due to low production of NADPH. This is the pathophysiology. Apart from that, you need to understand uh, there are certain triggers for G6P deficiency. Bef before that, we can tell what are the types of G6P deficiency or variants of G6P deficiency depending on the enzyme levels. So, class 1 is less than 1% enzyme only. The disease will be extremely severe and usually they will result in chronic 
non spherocytic hemolytic anemia you now like g6 p deficiency really does not result in spherocytes but autoimmune hemolytic anemia will result in spherocyte formation but g6pd typically don't result in spherocytic formation so chronic non spherocytic hemolytic anemia that's what is going to happen it's like a chronic intravascular hemolysis and what g6pd deficiency typically produces if they ask you answer will be intravascular hemolysis more than extravascular hemolysis or if you want a single answer in exam you can tell intravascular hemolysis that is very typical of a g6pd deficiency so which means it's going to result in chronic type 1 is going to result in chronic non spherocytic intravascular hemolysis and typical phase of intravascular hemolysis you will see like free hemoglobin hemoglobinuria dark colored urine hemosiderinuria and uh, you know like kidney injuries all these things can happen over time so number 2 less than 10 percentage severe this will cause only acute intermittent hemolytic anemia acute intermittent hemolytic anemia or hemolysis so why intermittent why it causes acute intermittent hemolysis because this is going to this acute intermittent hemolysis is going to be due to oxidant i mean only during some st stress or triggers there are a lot of triggers which i'll tell you in some time that when only when it is triggered by some event then only they will result go for acute hemolysis otherwise they will not have hemolysis they will be normal but this is something with or without trigger type 1 will be chronically having hemolysis but type 2 only during acute attacks or triggers they will have hemolysis and three if you ask me it is 10 to 60 percentage moderate and you will have occasional only not frequent this is frequent actually acute and frequent hemolytic anemia is occasional hemolysis will happen hemolytic anemia will happen only due to severe stress severe i mean very high level of oxidant stress then only they will go for hemolytic anemia then 60 to 150 percentage is class 4 which is usually normal and uh, they will be completely asymptomatic type 5 is more than normal at least excessive hormone activity again they don't have you cannot categorize this is completely asymptomatic so these two will be completely asymptomatic if they ask you among the deficiencies the first three are important if you talk about the deficiency the first three are important among this first three which are the most common is type 2 and type 3 if you want a single answer answer is type 2 type 2 is the most common among all the enzyme deficiencies if you ask me type 3 is little bit not that common but it's very common in black population type 3 is very common in blacks type 2 is very common in mediterranean population so that is why this is also called as g6pd mediterranean and g6pd blacks or you can call it as african americans or g6pd a minus so other names for this type 3 is g6pd a minus or g6pd blacks but that's the most i mean uh, that's very common at the same time this type 2 is supposed to be very very common in the mediterranean population but overall common is the type 2 only type 1 is actually quite rare you don't get that often type 1 is very rare where the patient will have a chronic with with trigger or without trigger they will have a hemolysis in a chronic over a chronic time so these are the variants of g6pd which are discussed in the deficiency happens in 1 2 and 3 typically and what are the triggers i told you there are certain specific triggers and precipitating events are there what are the triggers and precipitating events the first one is the drugs first one is the drugs so lot of drugs can trigger very important for exams are sulfonamides it can be triggered with dapsone it can be triggered with nitrofurantoin these are very important commonly used drugs nitrofurantoin it can be triggered with primaquin classic exam question then you can get with doxorubicin you can get with the rasburicase or peglotikase i am not writing peglotikase rasburicase or peglotikase then you can get with dabrafeneb then you can get with methylene blue which is used in uh, methemoglobinemia which i have discussed already so in this exam question will be sulfonamides dapsone nitrofurantoin primaquin and methylene blue these are the very important things for exam so many times ask question in that the most important will be primaquin and the dapsone still more important if you ask me primaquin and dapsone these are the most important things that can result in uh, your uh, trigger for g6pd i mean hemolysis in g6pd deficiency second it can get with infections infections what is the problem is i told you here already there will be some amount of nadph is there so nadph has two purposes i mean many purpose are there the most important two purpose are one is tackling oxidant stress tackling oxidant stress and second prince second purpose for nadp is nadph is respiratory burst otherwise called as oxidative burst so what happen is during infection actually infections will increase the respiratory burst and lot of nadph will be 
actually shifted to shunted to respiratory burst and already low NADPH, already NADPH is reduced and little is available for tack tackling the oxidant stress that is why oxidant stress will increase during infections. So that is the reason why they cannot tackle here. So many majority of the NADPH will be shunted to towards the respiratory burst phenomenon only. So that's why infections are very important triggers for hemolysis. Then you can get to decay, diabetic ketosis, then certain food like fava beans. That is why G63 deficiency caused hemolysis also previously referred to as favism, isn't it? So fa fava beans also is there. So this also can cause our food favism. This also can produce something called uh, I mean hemolytic anemia, trigger for hemolysis in G6 period deficiency. And if you ask me how will you diagnose G6 period deficiency, I mean clinical features of G6 PD, I already told you majority of them will be asymptomatic. But uh, if they are symptomatic, they come with intravascular hemolysis, features of intravascular hemolysis, which can be either acute, which is very, very common due to some specific triggers, or it can be chronic even without triggers, but causes typically non spherocytic hemolytic anemia. Usually intravascular hemolytic anemia will not cause spherocytes. Only extravascular usually causes spherocytes. It's intravascular predominantly, so spherocytes are very rare. And diagnosis-wise, if you ask me how to make a diagnosis, in peripheral smear, you will see something called Heinz bodies, which we discussed already, and uh, you might see this classic bite cells are blister cells, which again we have discussed in the RBC basic section itself and in the pathophysiology in G6P deficiency also I explained to you. Bite cells are blister cells. And um, there are two tests are there which are definitely for testing for G6P deficiency. One is called fluorescent spot test. Fluorescent spot test, which is a semi-quantitative test, which is a semi-quantitative test. And second one, you have something called the quantitative G6PD levels. Quantitative G6PD levels. Remember, both these testing should only be performed during the remission. You should not perform this test in acute stage. You should never perform this in acute stage. You should perform only in remission, which means when the patients are in uh, stage where there is no hemolysis. Why this is very important because uh, during hemolysis definitely there will be reticulocyte production. So whenever there is a hemolysis, acute hemolysis, acute hemolysis there will be increased reticulocyte production. Reticulocyte. This reticulocyte is fresh one. It's a new RBC, this fresh RBC. They may have a normal G6PD levels initially to come with. They may have normal G6PD and all the RBCs, old RBCs have gone hemolysis and they are dead now. So there is no RBC, only fresh new RBCs are there in the form of reticulocytes and new RBCs which may have a normal G6PD levels which means the RBCs that had low G6PD levels have already been destroyed in hemolysis. So the report, report may come as falsely normal G6PD. That is the reason why you should not check during acute hemolysis stage. You give time and once the patient goes for remission in the non-hemolytic stages, when the patient is not having anemia, that time you can go for the I mean, testing for G6PD levels. Treatment, there is no treatment, you have to just avoid the triggers. Avoid triggers. Maybe they, need, they might need transfusion, um, you know, like just to support during severe anemia and acute hemolysis. During acute hemolysis, they may go for severe anemia, that time you might need transfusion. Apart from that, you don't need any treatment for this as such. You don't have any treatment as such, you have to just avoid the triggers. Mm -hmm.